Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India So hello and welcome to this MPTO course entitled Transcendental Fiction where we're looking at Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness. So from this lecture, we'll move on to certain selected passages which we'll examine in some details because I think uh, we have discussed already, we've discussed at length the cultural context of a novel, the uh, narrative politics in a novel to a large extent. So we now move into certain sections which are important and relevant for us for the purpose of examining the novel more clearly and more complexly. Now, Today, we're going to move to one, who is probably the most important character in the novel, uh, Colonel Kutz, uh, who never really appears in the novel except as some kind of a ghostly presence. And the ghostly quality, the spectral quality about Kutz is actually very, very important. He's a shadowy figure in Heart of Darkness. He's never really fleshed out as a character. Uh, but that is part of the centerlessness in Heart of Darkness, that the most important character, or rather the the entire novel is about Kurtz, it's about finding Kurtz, but he never appears in the proper sense of the word. Uh, he just appears in a very, very uh, translucent manner and then it disappears. So he appears and then he dies uh, very, very quickly, but the entire novel is about him. So one can look at Kurtz less as a character and more as a symptom uh, in Heart of Darkness. So he's a symptom of imperialism. He's what, uh, you know, what imperialism does to you as a white person. Uh, so he becomes an example, a symbolic symptom of imperialism uh, and the excesses of imperialism. So he, he, you know, he embodies the excesses of imperialism. He's someone who has become the monster of imperialism. But we are told constantly that he is a perfect agent too. He was some, someone who was trained by Europe, uh, someone who was engineered by the entire imperial machinery of Europe and then sent off to control the colonies. So he's essentially uh, the machine gone wrong. Or uh, the machine turning rogue, so he's like a rogue agent that is be seen in spy cinema. Uh, so the rogue quality in Kurtz, the fact that it turns against the institution that had created him, uh, is important. And again, that is very relevant to some of the geopolitical uh, tensions we have in the world today. So as I keep telling you, how the darkness is very relevant and very topical and very resonant with some of the uh, geopolitical issues we have in the world today, in the Middle East issues, Iraq issues. Uh, foreign policies of uh, the white Western world, not least USA. So Heart of Darkness is about that, the complexity, the complications that come, the human complications, the political complications that arise uh, when you, you know, territorialize a, a non-white space, where you territorialize uh, a space through military machinery, through imperial machinery, etc. Right, so Kurtz is, uh, could be read as a symptom, could be read as a symptom of excess, but he's very much a shadowy spectral character. He's a spectre. Uh, in Heart of Darkness, is a ghost in Heart of Darkness, it never really appears, uh, but his entire novel is about him. Uh, so he is a center in Heart of Darkness who is also not a center, right? So the shadowy quality, the spectral quality of the center in Heart of Darkness, it contributes uh, to the centerlessness that the entire novel uh, you know, embodies in its narrative politics. Now, interestingly, uh, the first time there's a mention of Kurtz, he's mentioned in a very indirect way, right? And uh, the first allusion to Kurtz, the first reference to Kurtz in Heart of Darkness is through a painting, uh, something that he had painted some time ago, that marvelous pots in a wall. And then that's the first reference to Colonel Kurtz. And then he says, and this should be on a screen, where Marlowe says, then I notice a small sketch in oils on a panel representing a woman uh, draped and blindfolded, carrying a lighted torch. The background was somber, almost black. The movement of the woman was stately and the effect of the torchlight on the face was sinister. So if you look at the adjectives, interestingly, uh, you know, sinister obviously is what stands out at, at the end, is something evil and dark about that face. Uh, but also stately and somber, uh, almost black. So uh, there's a lot of sepulchral spectral quality uh, about this painting. And that spectra spectrality in the painting anticipates the spectrality that is embodied by Kurtz uh, eventually in the novel. So we see Kurtz first as you know, true representation made by him, right? So that's an interesting way to represent something, a true another representation. So the first piece of characterization about Kurtz and how the darkness is through a painting, is focalized through an artwork that he had presumably drawn some time ago. So the whole idea of you know, drawing a woman 
carrying a lighted torch but also being blindfolded so that that has an ambivalence to it as well so the lighted torch uh, traditionally and stereotypically uh, symbolizes progress enlightenment knowledge etc but at the same time we also see that the woman who is carrying the torch is draped and blindfolded so there's a degree of blindness about the knowledge and this is what I mean when I, this is what I meant when I said at the very beginning of Heart of Darkness, that the enlightenment in Heart of Darkness is a negative enlightenment. Uh, the illumination is a negative illumination. So the only knowledge that you get in Heart of Darkness is that of, uh, you know, non-illumination instead of darkness, right? So the only knowledge is dark knowledge. So the lighted torch becomes a symbol of knowledge. But at the same time, the person embodying that knowledge is blindfolded. So there's a degree of blindness and darkness about the knowledge, which is important for us to understand. And like I said, if you look at the objectives closely, uh, the movement was stately and the effect of the torchlight on a face was sinister. There's something almost cinematic about this particular uh, image. If you look at the visual politics, there's a lot of light and half light that is played over here. And the photoplay is important because the photoplay generates uh, this, this spectral sinister effect over here, right? So in that sense, uh, this particular painting is very symbolic because A, it represents good uh, and B, it represents entire ambivalence around imperialism. So the whole mission of imperialism uh, as is popularly consumed as being a civilizing mission, as being an enlightening mission, uh, that very figure of enlightenment of civilization is blindfolded away. Uh, so the blindness and the insight they come together and it creates a blindness of insight. So the only insight that you get in Heart of Darkness is one of darkness, is one of blindness, which is something which is represented by this figure, uh, who, who is ironically and um, appropriately, not ironically, appropriately sketched by Colonel Kutz, uh, who is perhaps uh, the most perfect example of the symptom of imperialism. Well, what does imperialism do to you existentially? Uh, the, the almost pathological quality of imperialism in a way that it consumes you as a person, it consumes you existentially, right? So we talked about the slightly cannibalistic quality of imperialism as well, that it eats you up. Okay, so the, the painting is important and uh, it's, um, it's a very, very political painting as well as uh, I hope you've established by now. It arrested me and it stood by civilly holding an empty half pint champagne bottle, medical comforts with a candle stuck in it. To my question, he said, Mr. Kutz had painted us in this uh, very station more than a year ago while waiting for means to go to his trading post. So the first reference to Kurtz over here. And then, uh, uh, you know, Marlo says, tell me, pray, so like, who is this Mr. Kurtz? So Marlo has, you know, Marlo keeps hearing about Kurtz all the time uh, through different figures. Uh, but now the, the first real description of Kurtz appears in, in Heart of Darkness over here. Uh, so we're told that uh, and Marlo is obviously relaying the information to us. And the, the relay of information is important because it, it sort of replicates to a certain extent the relay of information in colonial signposts where information would come, uh, you know, through telecommunications, so telegrams, telephones, uh, um, you know, through different kinds of signposts. So it, that too had a relay system. They had a sort of a conveyor belt relay system, which is the way we, we, we consume information as well as readers in Heart of Darkness. So tell me, pray, say, I said, I, who is this Mr. Kutz? The chief of the inner station, he answered in a short tone, looking away. Uh, Much obliged, I said, laughing. And you're the brick maker of the central station. Everyone knows that. Now, before I move any further, I just want to spend a little bit of time uh, talking about and sort of unpacking this one sentence, the chief of the inner station. Now, literally and physically, the inner station would be the, the most uh, innermost uh, sign pairs of the empire, right? And this is obviously the Belgian empire, uh, the Belgian colony in Congo. And Kurtz happens to be uh, the, 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 the controller or the master of the inner station. The innermost station is something which is inhabited and controlled by Kurtz. But um, we can also do a psychological reading of this. And there are lots of very complex and sophisticated and elegant uh, psychoanalytic readings of Heart of Darkness, uh, which uh, one very tempting reading out of that would be to look at Kurtz as the innermost subconscious of imperialism. So if you look at the entire machinery of imperialism through a psychological structure, uh, Kurtz inhabits the innermost psychological structure of imperialism, which is the darkest structure, the most guilty structure, the most ambivalent structure, the most complex structure. So the chief of the inner station can be read in either way. It could be the physical reading, the literal reading of the master of the innermost 
colonial station, which controls the colonial machinery of Congo. Uh, and more temptingly, and perhaps more psychologically, it could also be the innermost subconscious that is inhabited by Kurtz. Right? So in that Freudian psychoanalytic reading, Kurtz becomes the, uh, the Eid, so to say, of imperialism. You know, this Eid, ego, superego thing. And you know, so he becomes the innermost layer of that uh, subconscious that is controlling imperialism. So, and, you know, presumably he's a darkest point of imperialism. Yeah, and, you know, Marlowe obviously responds to this in a flippant way and says, oh, and you are the brick maker of the central station. Everyone knows that. He was silent for a while. He's a prodigy, he said at last. He's an emissary of pity and science and progress and devil knows what else. Uh, we want, he began to declaim suddenly, for the guidance of the cause entrusted to us by Europe, so to speak, higher intelligence, wide sympathies, a singleness of purpose. Right? So the whole idea of Kurtz being, I mean, we already see he's a bit of a painter as well, but then he's uh, also described as being an emissary of science and progress. Uh, but then also notice the way in which this uh, presumably positive epithet uh, or series of epithets, of, you know, very, very positive epithets, pity, science and progress is also described. It also continued uh, by this phrase and devil knows what else, uh, which is obviously a very dark, sinister kind of a way to describe something. Devil knows what else. So he's a prodigy. He's an enlightened person. He's a genius. Uh, he's an embodiment of pity and science and progress, but devil knows what else. So, you know, science, pity, progress, are normally Christian qualities according to this you know, Eurocentric enlightenment logic. But the whole illusion of devil over here complicates that narrative to a certain extent. We want for the guidance of the cause entrusted to us by Europe, so to speak, higher intelligence, wide sympathy, the singleness of purpose. Who says that? I ask. Lots of them, he replied. Some even write that. So he comes here, a special being, and as you ought to know. Why ought I to know? He in I interrupted, really surprised. He paid no attention. Yes, today he is the chief of the best station. Next year he will be an assistant manager. Two years more, and but I dare say you know what he will be in two years' time. You are the new gang, the gang of virtue. The same people uh, who sent him specially also recommended you. Oh, don't say no, I've seen my own eyes of trust. So, and Amala becomes part of the uh, continuity of this narrative. So, he, you know, this person is telling him that the same people who sent could sent you. So, you're part of the virtue narrative of imperialism, right? You're part of the uh, value narrative, the value added narrative of imperialism, which looks at imperialism as a noble, value added, virtuous mission. Mm -hmm. Okay. Light dawned upon me. My aunts, my dear aunts, influential acquaintances were producing an unexpected effect upon the young man. I nearly burst into a laugh. Do you read the company's confidential correspondence? I asked. He hadn't a word to say. It was great fun. When Mr. Kurtz, I continued severely, is a general manager, you won't have the opportunity. Okay. Now, uh, <clears throat> the first you know, the whole idea of Kurtz being uh, the emissary of Europe or the emissary of European enlightenment and imperialism is interesting over here because when we get to see Kurtz, uh, we, when we get closer to Kurtz, we never get to see him, but we get closer and closer to Kurtz. And obviously, it's very cinematic, the whole thing. It's almost like Marlowe is moving in with a movie camera uh, and then describing everything around us without knowing what it is. So it's like a movie camera recording everything without interpreting anything because he's a very bad interpreter. Uh, as you've seen already, he's a very unreliable narrator. He doesn't quite know what's happening around him. He just records everything and relays it back to us. So in that sense, How the Darkness is a very cinematic uh, narrative. And as I mentioned to you before, in one of the early lectures about this text, that there's a lot of films made in How the Darkness, the most famous among which would be Francis Ford Coppola's Apocalypse Now, uh, which is about uh, the Vietnam War. Uh, and, you know, this American agent which, who goes rogue the best American agent uh, played in the film by Marlon Brando. He's called Kurtz and the novelist in, in that film as well. Uh, and he's a person who is assassinated in the end because he becomes a problem uh, for the entire machinery which had created them in the first place historically. And again, the whole idea of the white imperial machinery of creating an agent uh, who then turns rogue, who then becomes a problem for that machinery and has to be uh, you know, disposed of. It's a very familiar narrative today as well in different geopolitical settings that we see today. So, you know, the whole politics of terrorism, the whole politics of geopolitical uh, ter territorialization, uh, it often uh, has these kind of markers, you know, the whole idea of creating an agent 
the best agent uh, who is trained by the white imperial machinery and then turns against the machinery and then becomes a problem, classified as a terrorist, etc. So in that sense, Heart of Darkness is one of the early, it seems to anticipate some of the current geopolitical tensions that we experience today in an increasingly globalized world. Okay, now uh, let's just move on and see, uh, you know, uh, take a look at uh, the, the entire atmosphere in Heart of Darkness and how the, the atmosphere is described to us. Um, you know, in, in very, very um, you know, visceral terms. And now we see this whole idea of the fence. Beyond the fence, and this should be on the screen, beyond the fence, the forest stood up spectrally in the moonlight and through that dim star, through the faint sounds of that lamentable courtyard, the silence of the land went home to one's very heart. Its mystery is greatness. So again, look at the spectrality. The word spectral is actually given to us over here. The ghostly quality, you know, and by spectral, obviously what is meant uh, is an ambivalent uh, location between the real and the unreal. So the spectral is somewhere in between. It's a liminal landscape between the real and the unreal. Uh, so again, even the landscape is liminal in quality. Even the landscape is, um, you know, ambivalent in quality. And that ambivalence is something which is uh, atmospheric over here, okay? Its mystery is greatness, the amazing reality of its concealed life. The head nigger moaned feebly somewhere nearby. So again, uh, the word nigger uh, appears in her darkness. It's obviously a banned word today. Uh, and this is what I mean when I said at the beginning of this novel that the, the reason why this is such an important, relevant novel to us today is perhaps precisely because of its political incorrectness. It doesn't want to conceal uh, it's political incorrectness. So it's very politically incorrect. Uh, it's quite racist in its descriptions of the non-white person. Uh, almost no non-white person speaks in outer darkness. And even the landscape is exoticized. And then everything is focalized through a white man's lens, through a white man's perspective. All that is there. But that actually contributes uh, to the ambivalence generated by outer darkness. It doesn't glamorize imperialism. It doesn't make imperialism into a heroic enterprise. It does ask some very deep, uh, and dark questions about the nature and quality of imperialism as a machinery. And it takes away the entire uh, glamour, the noble glamour or the virtue glamour out of imperialism and experiences that as a very exploitative machinery, as an exploitative enterprise, you know, just looks at it the way it really is, historically. Okay, uh, so, and the whole idea of this person preparing Marlowe for Kurtz is interesting because Kurtz, as I mentioned, never really appears in Heart of Darkness. He's talked about all the time. He's very much a third person presence and the person talked about. Uh, and that actually informs the spectrality. He never really appears directly. Now, interestingly, Marlowe describes this particular person who's some kind of an accountant uh, that he's talking to. I'll let him run on this paper mag Mephistopheles. It's almost like a paper man. It's almost something mannequinish about this person, and this mannequin-like quality about this person is important. It seemed to me that if I tried, I could poke my forefinger through him and would find nothing inside but a little loose dirt, maybe. Okay, and this is, if you remember, uh, the point in which I stopped the last lecture, uh, we talked about the hollowness in Heart of Darkness, you know, the centerlessness of Heart of Darkness is part of the hollowness. And that hollowness informs even the characters. So, you know, this particular person, uh, you know, this accountant person, uh, he goes on on relentlessly talking about kids and then Malu has a feeling that if I poke my finger into his body, uh, he just crumble and fall because there is no center holding him. And again, that's part of the centerlessness in Heart of Darkness that we see all the time. Nothing but a little loose dirt, maybe. He, don't you see, had been planning to be assistant manager by and under this present man. And I could see that coming, that a coming of that Kurtz had upset him, both not a little. He talked precipitately and I tried, did not try to stop him. I had my shoulders against the wreck of my steamer, holed up on a slope like a carcass or some big river animal. The smell of mud, a permeable mud by Jove, was in my nostrils. The, still, the high stillness of the permeable forest was before my eyes. There were shiny patches on the Black Creek. So again, look at the uh, immobility, the immutable quality of the forest around uh, Marlow. And again, this atmospheric ambivalence about the forest, it doesn't quite know what things are. It can't quite um, create a cognitive landscape around him. So it's like a non-cognitive or pre-cognitive landscape uh, around Marlow. It doesn't quite know what things are, right? Um, and the river, interestingly, uh, is described in very mystical terms, very psychological terms. So the landscape in Heart of Darkness is very, obviously it's very exoticized. It's, it's entirely done through white man's eyes. 
uh, it takes away the reality of the Congo landscape, it takes away the reality of the African landscape. But at the same time, there's a degree of psychologization about this landscape and there's a lot of psychological investment in this landscape which makes it more uh, mystical or, or cryptic, uh, cognitively cryptic uh, in a, to a large extent. Okay. So, um, and then uh, he moves on and, uh, and this particular passage which we will see at the moment. Um, he talks about Kurds all the time and then uh, there is a degree of frustration about Malu as well in terms of grappling with who Kurds is, right. And that frustration uh, is spilled over outside the narrative frame as well in the sense that it comes to us as well. That we as readers are getting frustrated. We want to know, we want to have more information on Kurds. We have, want to have more centered information on Kurds but we do not get that. And among other things, uh, Heart of Darkness is essentially uh, about the absence of information is about the annihilation of information and that is a very important thing because the entire machinery of imperialism relied on information, right. So, it was an informative machinery, it was an information economy which had to be generated in order that for imperialism to flourish and prosper. But then this entire annihilation of information, entire crisis of information is part of the crisis of imperialism in Heart of Darkness that we do not get any information at all. Even as readers, we keep looking at, uh, we keep looking at Malu to supply us more data about Kurds and no data comes. And this is what he says over here. Uh, I had a notion it somehow would be helped to that Kurds whom at that time I did not see, you understand. He was just a word for me. So, Kurds was just a word for me, uh, that is what Malu says. I did not see the man in the name any more than you do. Do you see him? Do you see the story? Do you see anything? It seems to me I am trying to tell you a dream, making a vain attempt because no relation of a dream can convey the dream sensation, that commingling of absurdity, surprise and bewilderment uh, in the tremor of uh, struggling revolt, that notion of being captured by the incredible which is of the very essence of dreams. So, uh, and then he goes on and says uh, he was silent for a while. No, it is impossible. It is impossible to convey the life sensation of any given epoch uh, of one's existence, that which makes it makes its truth its meaning, its subtle and penetrating a sense. It is impossible. We live as we dream alone. So, I stop at this point today, but I will just go back and unpack this a bit. And just to give you a reference, uh, if you want a more complex understanding of what is happening here, I mean this might be beyond the scope of this particular course, but if you are interested, uh, I have a paper, a published paper on Heart of Darkness. If you google me up, uh, it will appear uh, and you can download it for free. Uh, it is actually called Do You See the Story? Uh, so, I take that title by quoting Malo, which is from the previous page. Uh, you know, this do you see the story? Do you see anything? You know, that last line on this page on your screen now. So, if you just type my name, Abhishek Pari, in Google and Heart of Darkness, this, this should show up. And in that paper, I argue that the entire novel, Heart of Darkness, is about narrative crisis. I, mean, I just talked about information crisis. There is no information at all available. Uh, but it is also about narrative crisis. Malu does not quite know how to put his experience into a story. And that narrative crisis almost becomes a medical condition in Heart of Darkness. The fact that I cannot tell you the story. I cannot tell you what happened to me in Congo. I experienced it. Uh, it affected me deeply. It impacted me deeply, existentially. It changed me forever. Now, when I have come back to tell you the story, I cannot tell you the story because I cannot put that experience into a narrative. And his inability to place experience into a narrative is part of the crisis in Heart of Darkness, is part of the information crisis that we see as, in, as well. We do not have enough information to generate a narrative out of the experience. So, we can just experience it, we can absorb the experience, we can consume the experience, but we cannot convert that into a narrative in Heart of Darkness. That is part of the problems. So if you want to read more about this in more uh, complex cognitive uh, theoretical terms, you can look it up, you can look up my uh, paper, just type, just go to Google. Uh, type my name Abhishek Pari and write Heart of Darkness, it should show up. It is titled Do You See the Story? Uh, and I think the title paper is uh, Existential and Cognitive Crisis in Heart of Darkness. If you still do not find it, uh, you can write in the forum and my TAs can get back to you and we can upload it in the forum if need be. But it should be available online, uh, you can download it, I have made it free for everyone to access it. Okay, so, uh, so this bit uh, when he is uh, and this is almost like a frustrating, agonized uh, articulation uh, by Marlowe when he sort of 
admits that it seems to me I'm telling you a dream. It seems to me that you don't, you don't getting, you're not getting what I'm telling you. I can't put that into a narrative. It is impossible to put my story into a narrative, put my experience into a story, sorry. Um, and then he acknowledges it. So this entire admission of inadequacy, the entire acknowledgement of inadequacy is something which is very important in Heart of Darkness. So in that sense, it's, it's a very modernist novel. It's about stream of consciousness. It's about the mind. It's, everything is about the mind. The landscape becomes a mindscape, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But it also, in, in many senses, it is also uh, one of the earlier postmodernist novels because it gives you a very good example of unreliable narration. And the unreliability is something which is uh, struggled with in Heart of Darkness. And Mahler himself knows that he, as a narrator, is very, very unreliable and very inadequate. But the only difference between this novel and, let's say, a Salman Rushdie novel, uh, let's say, Minas Children, which too has an unreliable narrator, by the way, the only difference is attitudinal. There's a difference in attitude. So in Heart of Darkness, Mahler seems to moan the fact that he can't tell the story. He seems to moan the fact that he's an unreliable narrator. There's a degree of lament and moaning that takes place along with the admission of unreliability. But when you come to Midnight's Children, when you come to something like Salim Sinai, which is a, create, which is a character created by Salman Rushdie, in, in Salman Rushdie's novel, uh, Midnight's Children, that unreliability is celebrated. It's not lamented, it's, it's celebrated. So that centerlessness which you see in Heart of Darkness, which is a problem, which is a crisis in Heart of Darkness, that becomes a privilege. Uh, in Midnight's Children. And that's the only difference between uh, a, a classic postmodernist text like uh, Midnight's Children and an anticipating postmodernist text, an anticipatory postmodernist text such as Heart of Darkness. So the attitudinal difference is what makes uh, you know, the two novels different, uh, you know, despite the structural similarities and functional similarities of level of narrative. Okay. So he's admitting over oh, yeah, here the absurdity of his story and he's telling you, uh, he's telling the, 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 the readers as well as the listeners over oh, yeah, here, it seems to me I'm trying to tell you a dream, making a vain attempt. Uh, it's like a Sisyphean effort. Uh, no matter how hard I try, I can't tell you what exactly took place, what exactly I experienced in outer darkness. Because no relation of a dream can convey the dream sensation. So this whole inability to convert a sensation into a narrative is what is admitted over oh, yeah. here. That commingling of absurdity, surprise, and bewilderment in a tremor of struggling revolt. That notion of being captured by the incredible, which is at the very essence of dream. So it's a combination of absurdity, surprise, bewilderment. So how can you put that commingling, how, how can you put that entanglement into a logical, realist narrative? Right. So again, among other things, How to Darkness is also uh, a novel about the a crisis of classic realism as a narrative style. Right, so it's, uh, it's almost like telling you classic realism is breaking up as a narrative style and we need a new style to tell stories. Okay, so in that sense, it's quite metafictional as well. So it's a classic realist novel about the crisis of classic realism. That it, as a narrative technique, it is inadequate to tell stories about dreams, about psychological situations, which have to account for absurdity and bewilderment. And then he ends by saying it is impossible. So this is an admission of failure. It is impossible. It is impossible to convey the life sensation of any, any given epoch of one's existence, that which makes us truth, its meaning, its subtle and penetrating sense. It's impossible we live as we dream alone. Right? So again, uh, you know, this is about the alienation of the storyteller, the loneliness of the storyteller. Uh, and How to Darkness, in a sense, is about the loneliness of the storyteller. So he comes back as a storyteller. Uh, you know, he wants to tell the story of what happened to him in Congo, uh, his experience of suffering, his bewilderment, his you know, absurdity that he consumed. But he can't put that into a narrative. And that becomes part of the narrative problem, but also it almost becomes an existential problem. So again, look at the way in which storytelling and existential uh, locations are you know, entangled with each other in Heart of Darkness. So I'll stop at this point today and move on uh, to a different passage in the lectures to come. Thank you for your attention.